the uh, topic of my talk is going to be looking at some of the, let's say, community practices, but also some of the direction my lab has taken in trying to understand what was previously beautifully described as the complexity of connectivity, except in this case focusing on techniques we have available to map this in the human brain. And uh, in order to do that, building on insights that we have from uh, macaque monkey track tracing, data sets available in the marmoset um, monkey, as well as classical approaches and studies in the, um, in the neuroanatomy literature. But to, to kick this off, I'm, I'm a just read a wonderful uh, biography of Alexander von Humboldt, and I, I was so compelled by this image that, that was put together. When, when Humboldt went off to South America, uh, the, the uh, state of the art of understanding the natural world, of understanding botany, was taxonomy. It was to divide it up into hierarchies uh, of divisions between different species. And after his trip, he had a, a vision or a way to synthesize this knowledge by embedding it in the geography of the terrain. And what was so innovative about this approach, where he's placing different plant species in these uh, mountainscapes that you see here at different points in this world, was to recognize the axes of relevance for characterizing systematic differences across these different species. So that, as before, the approach was to embed them in a hierarchy in reference to each other, he was able to see the way in which they fit within a common space and what aspects of that space were specifically relevant uh, for understanding their distribution and consistency. I, I think they're absolutely stunning and I also see them in some ways as one of the uh, frameworks for thinking about what we can bring to mapping the human and more generally the cerebral cortex. What are the axes of relevance? Um, how do different features overlap? And what is a way or a coordinate space in which we can look at it that allows us to um, better simplify and understand these, these layers of features that emerge? So there are numerous scales for mapping. I think this is beautifully illustrated uh, by uh, Betzel and Bassett's uh, review from their image from a few years ago. There are multiple different scales and, let's say, characteristics or features which we can use for mapping the human brain and which are present in the literature. Two of the most common, I would say, or present are looking at different regions, areas, or networks in a spatial sense, and looking at graph topology, which has already been addressed in the prior talk beautifully. So for those familiar, uh, and those not, uh, functional networks, or dividing the brain up into distinct long distance patterns of, let's say, functionally homogeneous systems, is one of the major approaches. Looking at connectivity topology, which is already addressed, is another. The approach of looking at networks really emerged, uh, let's say, conceptually from cognitive psychology and its integration with the tools of neuroimaging, specifically this notion of localized function, which in this case just gets reincarnated as functions that are spatially distributed across distant regions. But in terms of thinking about this as connectivity organization, it's still quite limited. On the other side of the spectrum, we have uh, graph theory-based approaches, which are incarnated as uh, exploring the topology of human brain connectivity, and then get reduced to these various principles of organization, small worldness, efficiency, et cetera. And while those have been quite valuable, they also become completely divorced from the underlying anatomy of the cortex. And so one of the, the challenges, <clears throat> to jump very quickly in the interest of time, one of the, the challenges in my lab and others as well has been precisely this point that was brought up before, of, how to bring anatomy, how to recognize the uh, consistency of the spatially embedded structure in which all this connectivity is taking place, and how to integrate that into our way of thinking about the organization of connectivity. Um, so essentially going back to anatomy. And I'll go through this story very quickly um, to jump to the main point, which is that there's a, a very rich tradition in classical neuroanatomy texts uh, that over decades developed the notion of a hierarchy of cortical areas based on laminar structure, which is translated to a hierarchy of cortical areas based on their connectivity with one another. And I think this comes together quite beautifully in a review by Marcel Messalem in the late 90s, where he integrates across these different levels of neuroscientific research to propose a, a hierarchical model of uh, global integration, a global hierarchy essentially, with functional consequences and is able also to relate that to various clinical questions in the human as well. All of this that he proposes, and this is of course schematized, 
is at the time based on track tracing work in the macaque monkey, which he hypothesizes to be uh, present in this structure in the human brain. Um, and it's precisely this structure that we then aim to investigate using empirical data, uh, which is now available. So essentially what the model proposes is a sensory segregation, which, uh, again, I know there is evidence to the contrary on this point, but this is trying to capture the, uh, let's say, the major characteristics or uh, the broad strokes of these patterns, even though there are exceptions that may be quite relevant. Um, but sensory segregation along the angle here, and then as we move towards the center of these concentric circles along individual synaptic steps from area to area, uh, it describes this as a hierarchical processing uh, towards a center, an integrative set of regions, of transmodal regions shown in red. Um, to move very quickly here, we, uh, the main technique that we use is functional connectivity, resting state functional connectivity, where we simply put people in the scanner, have them look at a crosshair, do their best to stay awake, hold very still, and we acquire anywhere from five, six minutes to an hour of data. And what's been notable about this approach and about the field in general is that we're able to map cortical-cortical connectivity patterns with a high degree of spatial precision. Um, it, in, the, uh, in prior work that I'd be happy to discuss over the next couple of, how do we, next couple of days, um, we've been able to demonstrate the convergence with what we observe from track tracing studies in the macaque monkey. Um, but uh, is that video playing? There we go. Um, but uh, I think some of the concerns that have been raised about diff uh, diffusion-weighted imaging-based tractography are certainly present in resting state data. However, one of the reasons I've stuck to it as a methodology is that it allows for this high degree of spatial precision in mapping cortical cortical patterns of connectivity. What you're observing here are fluctuations as they would be acquired in the scanner. Red is high, blue is low, green is somewhere in the middle. This is just percent bold signal change, and it's these very slow fluctuations uh, that we're able to uh, use to map patterns of spatiotemporal dependency. The approach that we use to go back to Meslam's model and to characterize these kind of global patterns of connectivity or spectra of connectivity just to give an illustration of this idea, uh, is to take the connectivity graph that you see on the left here, where let's just say that uh, the position of nodes reflects the similarity of their connectivity patterns or their degree of connectivity. We can also reflect that as a connectivity matrix or an affinity matrix. And then using a technique called diffusion map embedding, which is essentially a nonlinear um, decomposition technique that allows us to capture the maximum variance along several dimensions in this connectivity matrix, we can then map out uh, these components of connectivity, these dimensions of variance in connectivity patterns. So this is simply illustrating a reordered matrix based on the principal component uh, or the component capturing the maximum variance, but we can map out then or orthogonal uh, dimensions as well. If we apply this to functional connectivity data, in this case using the human connectome project data, what we observe uh, is a structure quite similar to what is present in uh, the theory proposed by Messalum in the late 90s, where we have segregation between different sensory modalities, visual, uh, sensory motor auditory in blue and green, and then integration towards this set of regions, these transmodal regions presented in red here towards the center of that space. Um, now, just focusing in on that dimension, uh, gradient one, what we find is that at the peak of that, if we spread out the colors uh, to see where the peak lies, it's a set of regions that have been described in the human as the default mode network. And so what this appears to capture is a kind of spectrum of connectivity networks that's been considered a canonical set of resting state networks or intrinsic networks in the human that fall along this dimension such that we have unimodal networks on one end in blue and purple, visual and motor set of attention networks, and then moving towards these higher order uh, memory-related uh, uh, networks, uh, such as the, the front bridle and the default mode network. And it allows us to shift from thinking about these as discrete entities towards uh, interrelated, uh, interrelated connectivity patterns that fall along the spectrum. Um, 
again, just in the interest of, of time, I'm going to present this very briefly, but I believe uh, the following talks will go into this in a bit more detail. Uh, we've also been able to observe this in macaque monkey data as well as marmoset data, which raises a question of the degree to which this may be a preserved or conserved axis uh, of phylogenetic expansion in connectivity patterns. It also is a, allows us a framework for describing, uh, describing these network structures across species because we no longer have to enter in explicitly to the uh, various functional definitions of, for instance, the default mode network to debate whether or not it exists in these other species as it does in the human. We can look at these dimensions of organization and use that as a reference frame to then uh, characterize whether or not these different patterns, um, or sorry, what are the uh, correspondences across these different species in these patterns of connectivity and in these functional systems. So it allows us a different reference frame, which I think is quite valuable when we're moving into species where it becomes more progressively more difficult to characterize precisely what the functions are. So how does this organization emerge? And here I'm going to move to the question of cortical geometry. So stepping away from connectivity and focusing directly on uh, the uh, structure of the cortex. How does this emerge? And this was actually one of the starting points for us for this project. Uh, Buckner and Creenan proposed a hypothesis uh, or a theory uh, a few years ago uh, in a wonderful review that started with the basic question of why is it or how is it that we see the emergence of... Uh, such a large degree of association cortex in the human brain. How does that occur? What they propose is the tethering hypothesis. And the basic idea of this hypothesis is that in the ancient malian cortex, which is quite a bit smaller than the human, we have different uh, portions of sensory cortex that are quite proximate to each other. They're determined by molecular gradients during cortical ontogenesis. And uh, there is a, a hierarchical structure between them, and that that's that, that determines the position of them. But then we have dramatic cortical expansion in the human brain. We still have those gradients that determine the position of primary cortex. We have inputs from the thalamus uh, that establish their functional specialization. However, there is all of this other cortex surrounding those portions uh, that were functionally determined, which are left to essentially interconnect by various other mechanisms, they're untethered from the gradients that determine the specialization of primary cortex. What this suggested to us when we read it is that if this is the case, there should be a highly precise spatial mapping between the position of uh, association cortex and the location of primary uh, areas. And so in this case, we aim to test that by using the distance along the cortical surface um, as a way to kind of characterize this expansion as a relationship between regions. And so what we're going to do now is place seed regions in those white points that you see on the cortex. Those are located at the local maxima of the principal gradient. And just measure every other point in the cortex how uh, its shortest distance to any one of those points. So at every other point in the cortex, how close it is to any of those positions, just using the geometry of the cortex. Uh, and here's what we observe. So going from red now to blue, blue is further away. The gray lines that you see are the equidistant positions between these points. And what emerged, what was quite surprising to us when we first saw this was uh, the convergence with the morphological landmarks of primary uh, sensory motor areas. So that the central sulcus located here uh, is equidistant from the adjacent landmark or points of transmodal cortex uh, or default mode nodes if you're familiar with that literature. Likewise the calcarine sulcus uh, falls at an equidistant position between these uh, peaks of transmodal cortex or at the other end of the spectrum of this connectivity uh, spectrum. Uh, transverse sulcus as well so auditory cortex. So there appears to be a spatial correspondence between these systems that are on one hand oriented uh, towards incoming information from the environment, primary sensory areas, and at the other end of the spectrum, furthest away as you can possibly get, along the cortical surface are the regions that are involved in the most higher order integration or at the center of that connectivity space. And it suggests to me, I think, in, I'd be very interested to uh, discuss this further, um, it, it appears in this case, if we interpret 
uh, the geometry, the intrinsic geometry of the cortex as reflecting an aspect of intrinsic connectivity. It suggests that this may be a, a critical uh, organizing mechanism for what also emerges as long distance connectivity. And I should, I, th I want to really emphasize at this point that we're talking about one dimension of a, an extremely high dimensional space of connectivity. The principal gradient is capturing one, but it's the axis that represents the maximum variance in that space. And uh, so here this raises the question of the, to what degree that might be accounted for by aspects of underlying local connectivity um, away from primary cortex or away from transmodal cortex, but a convergence between these two aspects of connectivity. Okay. Um, in the, uh, about 10 minutes or so? Great. Um, so what I've shown so far is a relationship between geometry and uh, large-scale connectivity and this convergence in, in a similar space. Um, what I'd like to show now is some lines of work uh, from my lab as well as from Boris Bernhardt, uh, a collaborator uh, who's doing beautiful work at McGill, um, that try to relate this now to aspects of, of laminar structure to the degree that we can in the human brain. And there's been observations that go back decades now that there's a convergence between laminar structure and laminar differentiation, as illustrated here in the frontal cortex, and connectivity patterns, such that like preferentially, not exclusively, as was discussed, but preferentially connects to like. Areas that have similar degrees of cytoarchnotic differentiation preferentially interconnect to one, with one another. Um, Alex Gulas, who was uh, in my lab a few years back and is now in Hamburg, um, had a wonderful idea of could we explore this in the human brain and how might we be able to do that? And so with Julia Hudenberg, we looked at ways to be able to characterize degrees of cytoarchitonic differentiation or various aspects of the laminar pattern in the cortex and to relate that to human brain connectivity. Um, now, th <clears throat> this is showing a uh, whole brain distribution of cord intracortical myelin uh, as an illustration. There are ways of being able to characterize this using T1 maps, which has been validated in, uh, at the Max Planck in Leipzig a few years back. In another measure, using T1, T2 ratio, which is something I'll present uh, further in a couple of slides, this has also been used by the Human Connectome Project as a way of providing additional information about cortical structure in order to differentiate different areas. Just very briefly, uh, Yulia acquired high-resolution data at seven Tesla across eight subjects and was able to uh, demonstrate a similarity in the distribution of values from T1 maps reflecting intracortical myelin with the principal gradient from these same subjects as illustrated here. And the maps don't correspond perfectly, but they illustrate a general pattern of consistency between what we're observing purely in microstructure or in a proxy for microstructure and large-scale connectivity. Uh, this work has been extended further, taking advantage of the remarkable resource of the Big Brain Project um, that has been made available on Loris, if you're interested in downloading it. Um, and this is a uh, histological preparation at extremely high resolution that enables us to now relate using a consistent space to be able to map between connectivity and the non-invasive measures of connectivity have with aspects of um, cytoarchitecture and uh, histology-based information about the human brain. Conrad Wag still has done um, some analytic development to enable for the automated um, mapping of laminar profiles in the big brain data set, and this is an example of that. Uh, where you can now move across different regions of the cortex and characterize variation in the uh, neuronal density over the PL to white surface. So this is just illustrating this across different von Economo regions. Um, and I'm going through this quickly because of the next step in which uh, Casey Pequala from Boris Bernhardt's lab then took these different maps of cortical profiles, mapped the similarity between them, creating a matrix of similarity between uh, the uh, laminar profiles from the big brain data, described as microstructural profile covariance, sorted this in a similar way that I described before, using uh, connectivity data, and then, there we go, um, was able to 
present the dimension of maximum variance in variation of these profile patterns across the brain. And as you can see here, it reflects these uh, levels of cytoarctonic differentiation that I briefly described before. In many ways, this provides a kind of validation of the approach for looking at, at variance in these patterns, but it also allows us now to move back to the T1, T2 weighted ratio, which is something that we can characterize in vivo in the human brain. Uh, and to be able to map connectivity and these MR values using this microstructure profile covariance approach. Um, so in this case, just to uh, go through it again rather quickly in the interest of time, both on a group and individual level, uh, Boris and his lab were able to beautifully map a relationship between the principal gradient in connectivity and uh, covariance in these laminar profiles uh, in vivo demonstrating a convergence between aspects of cortical structure and long distance connectivity again. I think one of the exciting questions again is to go back and understand to what degree this relates to features of cortical geometry on the individual level. Um, I'll just very quickly, I think I just have a couple more slides um, to take the next step in asking the question of the degree to which this space helps us to understand distribution of functions. Um, this is an illustration from a review by Rahir Mahrez, um, Sajababdi and colleagues, uh, in which they demonstrate this principle that if you look at the distribution of uh, specific state, in this case it was a contrast between um, math and story from the Human Connectome Project task data set, if you just use the anatomy to reflect that, and this kind of gets back to that, that mountain picture that I showed at the beginning, if you just use the anatomy to try and understand that spatial distribution. They're quite intermixed. It's difficult to differentiate them. There's not a lot of uh, structure that is immediately recognizable that allows one to differentiate those patterns. By projecting the data into a space defined by uh, these patterns of connectivity in which we have the different dimensions reflecting um, progressively less variance in connectivity patterns, it allows us to very clearly demarcate a boundary between uh, these functional states uh, shown here. And the challenge becomes to not simply conduct this type of analysis in a data-driven way, but to have a clear neurobiological interpretation of what these dimensions reflect and why it is that we're using these dimensions to capture various aspects of cortical organization. Um, it's interesting that we see such convergence across these approaches, and that suggests that this is a legitimate um, set of axes for characterizing the functional domain, but we want to understand the mechanisms by which they arise and by which they determine uh, the distribution of specialized function. Um, this is simply a meta-analysis. I think I've got a couple of minutes left. So this is a, a meta-analysis in which we looked at the distribution of functions along the principal gradient, and as you might expect from looking at the distribution of these patterns. At one end, we do see the kind of motor sensory processing followed by domain general, and then all of these memory-driven, higher-order integration abstract processes at the opposite end. And again, this is simply a caricature of what we're observing there, but it does suggest this progression that was initially described by Messalem when he proposed this theory of integration from sensory input towards output or a um, sensory fugal pattern of organization. Um, this also enables us to ask questions about uh, where the, this large-scale global cortical hierarchy might be disturbed in various psychiatric disorders, in this case in autism spectrum disorder. This is again work from Boris Bernhardt, who's been uh, taking this line of research in, in numerous uh, really exciting directions. In this case, what uh, Boris and his group observed is a contraction along the principal gradient, so that in this... Um, spectrum of disorders that are in part characterized by uh, let's say sensory, uh, sensory processing, um, differences in sensory processing, there appears to be uh, differences in the way that that information is integrated towards the default mode end of the spectrum. And rather than trying to look specifically at one end versus the other, this allows to characterize it as a continuous space. So 
all in all, where this is going is towards establishing a dimension um, based in connectivity or otherwise of a coordinate space for the cortex. And I've already described this a bit, but uh, we have these several observations that appear to be consistent in how these features are distributed. The notion of there being a dimension in the cortex that begins with primary and goes towards higher order areas has been around for a very long time. There's nothing new here, but we have techniques and data available now to be able to actually map out the nuances of that space and to understand where they both converge and where they diverge and why that might be the case and what additional properties might be conferred by that divergence. Um, we recently can propose that distance might constitute some form or as a starting point for thinking about a cortical coordinate space. And I, I know this is an idea that has been discussed. Um, and I think what, at least one of the points I'd like to enter into the discussion with this is that the, a two-dimensional space may not, while, while it, it has great utility, doesn't appear to be the way the cortex itself is actually functionally organized. And so we may need to consider higher dimensional spaces that are consistent across species in varying ways, um, and what the most meaningful aspects of that geometry are. So here we've proposed the uh, distance from the transmodal peaks, as well as relative distance from various sensory modalities. Um, but I think that there's still a lot of work to be done here, and this was merely a proposal for a basic structure. Um, it gets back to that question of what, is the, what are the axes that are meaningful when we're thinking about uh, these spaces and what's going to best reflect uh, the various features um, in, in a, as low dimensional a way as possible. So with that, um, of course, I'd like to thank my old lab in Leipzig, uh, funders, all of the data and code is available there, and of course, Boris Bernhardt's lab uh, at MNI for much of the work that I presented as well. Um, thank you and happy to discuss. Okay. Thank you. We have time for a few questions, and then maybe Piotr can uh, bring up. Questions? Hello. Um, Wonderful talk, thank you. I think, could, could you elaborate on maybe how to start communicating to our colleagues more effectively that the fact that, despite the fact that we're embedding things in these spaces, like as you just said, two-dimensional, that maybe biology doesn't know anything about space to start with. Um, and so looking, how do, we, how do we then go look for those higher dimensional spaces? You mean, how, sorry. Sounds like a very interesting question, but I mean. Yeah. So, so what, what, is, what is the next step in looking for those higher dimensional spaces? Ooh. Um, you mean in going towards higher dimensional spaces? I mean, yeah. Okay, great. I think I'm with you. Um, and please tell me if I didn't follow uh, exactly. But it's very tempting to be driven by the, by the algorithms here. And of course, there are all sorts of constraints in these. And we, could, we, we applied diffusion map embedding. We've since tested and of course looked at various other approaches and it seems PCA, uh, principal component analysis, is perfectly reasonable for capturing this as well as long as, you know. um, but how to not simply be driven by, by the algorithms for pulling out these higher dimensions and how to ensure that each dimension uh, that we're including in this kind of a model or approach is actually meaningful. Yeah, we've been taking it quite slowly and carefully for that reason, so I think that that is a, a challenge. We're trying to return to the anatomy as quickly as possible from these decomposition techniques. I think it's important to use these data-driven techniques because otherwise we're, we're simply pointing at different features um, rather than letting the data kind of speak to us. But then to return back to the anatomy to try and understand how that might be capturing um, these features that are being observed in the data. Um, I should mention, I think uh, folks here are probably more familiar than I am, that these techniques using PCA components in neuroimaging has been around since the mid-90s, since the beginning of the field. It just wasn't really adopted widely in the way that resting state networks, independent component analysis, and those types. And I think in part that has to do, there wasn't a good framework that was introduced alongside it for how it should be interpreted within the field and discussed. And so one of the challenges has been to be very careful and slow about, about um, motivating this through through both the cognitive neuroscience and the anatomy. <laughs>
Sure. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. I uh, I look forward to continuing the continued discussion afterwards.